right. Okay. So um, street photography is basically a genre of photography that it's usually done candidly without the uh, person's permission or without their consent. Um, and it is also, excuse me there for a second. Uh, also, the essence of street photography is simply about documenting everyday life and humanity on the streets. So my name is Armando Flores, and I'm a national tech rep for Tamron USA. And I've been doing photography for quite some time now. I actually studied photojournalism in college, uh, but I never really practiced it because while I was going to college, I got hired. I got hired, I got hired by a uh, photo manufacturer by Nikon, and I was uh, – a rep for Nikon for 22 years. Uh, right after uh, Nikon, I moved on to Sony, and I was I was with Sony for five years, and now with Tamron for six years. So I've been, you know, I've had my chance uh, and opportunities to dabble in all sorts of uh, photography, uh, primarily uh, sports photography. With uh, uh, you know, during my stint at Nikon. Uh, 17 years doing uh, photography, uh, sports photography at a pro level. Uh, with Tamron, though, there is a lot of traveling. So uh, my focus now is more on uh, street photography, on travel and landscape. And anyway, those those sorts of uh, uh, genres of photography. Uh, but what we're going to cover today uh, will be, of course, camera settings, because your camera and your lenses are tools, and it's very important to know how to use them. Uh, you want to use the right tool for the right job, as they say. Uh, we are a lens manufacturer, so we will be talking about lenses and lens selection. Just like any type of photography, there is composition involved, so we will talk a little bit about that. And, you know, what do I throw in my camera bag and what is my reasoning behind it? Uh, also, uh, practice. Uh, let me tell you. I am still practicing. I've been doing this since 83, and every day I go out shooting, I pick up something new. So uh, very important to keep practicing because that, that will only improve uh, your experience in photography, uh, whatever type of photography you choose to do. So let's go ahead and get started uh, <clears throat> with camera settings. Now, these are camera settings that I do not use. Uh, the fully automated mode, or as I like to call it, the green mode of death, uh, do not use. And the, the reasoning behind that is because it is a fully automated mode. You have zero control, and the camera never asks for your input. Uh, so you have control over nothing. There is another setting uh, on the camera, uh, and that it would be in the scene modes. Now, the scene modes are, uh, again, fully automated, but they are pre-set or predetermined. In other words, they are biased towards either sports, portraits, landscape, macro, and many, many other choices. And like I said, once again, these are fully automated modes. Yes, they are biased a little bit towards a particular type of photography, but let's take, let's take an example, sports photography. Uh, it does not ask you what type of sports you're photographing. And as you can imagine, different types of uh, sports require different types of settings. So once again, uh, no way uh, would I go ahead and use a scene mode because I am restricted, uh, fully restricted to be honest with you. So a mode that uh, I do use a lot would be a manual mode. But the manual mode becomes a little bit tricky. Uh, it is one of those modes that is best used when the light Lighting is constant or controlled, uh, and you are using a uh, fixed aperture lens. Uh, for example, like, like a 70 to 200 to 8. Uh, that lens uh, zooms from 70 millimeters to 200 millimeters, uh, but it stays 2.8 throughout the zooming range. Some lenses are variable aperture lenses. Those lenses uh, will change the aperture from a, let's say, 3.5 to a 6.3 or an f5 to a 6.3. So as you zoom the lens, the lens does get longer. And the longer the lens gets, the further light has to travel through the lens to get to the sensor. So the amount of light actually hitting the sensor uh, does uh, diminish. 
And if you are in a manual mode, as you zoom out, you have to make a change to your exposure. Uh, and then that's where you might get into a little bit of trouble because as you know, if you ch make a change to one of the three variables, which is your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO, you must make a change to one of the other two or both in the opposite direction. So that's where you have to start thinking, well, if I change my shutter speed, yes, I will get, uh, for example, a faster shutter speed if that is uh, what I'm doing, but what am I actually causing? Uh, well, I'm causing the, the lens uh, to, to uh, need more light and I need a faster or a higher ISO. When you are doing street photography, you don't have a lot of time to think about what's going on with the exposure. So it's best to simply, uh, in my opinion, use something uh, to help you all along those lines. So once again, in a fully manual mode, when the lighting is constant or controlled, uh, for example, I went on a bike ride uh, a couple weeks uh, ago on a Friday afternoon. It was overcast. We call it the June gloom. And um, the lighting was constant for hours. So I set my exposure manually and just forget about it, concentrate on my subject matter and or what I want to capture. But when the lighting does change uh, or is changing constantly, what I do is I will revert to a semi-automated mode. Uh, for the most part, street photography, I will either use aperture priority or I will use another semi-automated mode. Uh, for portraiture, for macro, Aperture priority works well for me because it allows me to select my aperture because what I really want to do is to control my depth of field. I want to control what part or how much of my subject is in focus. The camera in turn then controls the shutter speed for me. It'll set it and I have control over everything else, the white balance, the ISO, the focusing, I mean, everything else I have full control over. So uh, a semi-automated mode allows me just a little more time to concentrate on my subject or what's in front of me. So in a case like this, uh, where I'm out uh, doing some street photography and uh, there are people involved, I can now concentrate on, okay, what do I want to capture? Well, in this case, I wanted everything in focus. So I needed a lot of depth of field. Uh, the camera then in turn set the shutter speed for me. I am always, however, aware of what that shutter speed is because I want to make sure that it's fast enough to freeze my subject if my subject is moving. Uh, so, you know, uh, semi-automated mode, great, but yes, you still have a, a lot of input and you have a lot of control over uh, what's going on. The other mode that I will use in uh, street photography, sports, and uh, wildlife would be shutter priority. Uh, shutter priority allows me to set the shutter speed because if I want to freeze the subject, I know what shutter speed to set. Uh, then I have control uh, over everything else. Uh, the camera in turn sets the aperture for me. And, uh, you know, it works for me because I, I still have control over all of the other settings, but I do have uh, the opportunity to uh, spend a little more time, once again, on the subject matter. So in a case like this, if I want to add a little bit of motion blur uh, to my subject, I'm able to simply slow down my shutter speed, in this case, all the way to uh, down to a 15th of a second, uh, focus on the subject, follow it across the scene, fire off a few frames, and there you go. But it's also very important to know what shutter speeds you may need uh, for certain uh, moving subjects. So here's a little uh, chart or table of shutter speeds needed to do uh, certain types of, uh, you know, moving subjects if you want to freeze them. If your subject is motionless, uh, a 1 60th to a 1 25th of a second is just fine because most of us can physically handhold a camera and lens at those particular shutter speeds. Uh, if your subject is moving a little bit, walking, for example, 125th to a 250th. If your subject is running uh, 500 to 1,000, as you can see, the faster your subject moves, the faster your shutter speed needs to be in order for you to freeze that movement. Again, these are starting points. The faster, the better. In this particular image that you're looking at here, uh, the writers were going at 
different uh, speeds. The rider that is right on the white line or the one closest to the lens uh, was traveling at 10 miles an hour. The other rider uh, behind him was doing uh, more like, like 20 miles an hour. I've took this picture at a thousandth of a second just so that you can get an idea what that shutter speed could do. The rider uh, traveling slower was completely frozen while the rider in the background that was uh, going a little bit faster has just a little bit of motion blur. So in this particular case, a two thousandth of a second would have been much better. So once again, uh, it is important to know if you are in a semi-automated mode, what the camera is controlling so that you can make changes if necessary. Other camera settings that I use uh, all the time with street photography uh, would be continuous autofocus, continuous shooting. Uh, I do control my white balance, uh, usually, in auto, but sometimes you do need to set it manually yourself. Uh, auto ISO, a very interesting uh, setting that I've begun to use just a little bit more, uh, but we'll talk about that. And of course, metering modes. Your camera has multiple metering modes and it's very important, once again, to know what they are and how they work. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump right in uh, to uh, continuous autofocus. So if your subject is moving, the distance from the subject to the lens is changing. So the camera needs to continuously autofocus so that it can keep your subject in focus because uh, who wants a blurry picture, right? Uh, so continuous autofocus is very important uh, when your subject is moving. <clears throat> For those of you shooting Canon, I believe they call it AI servo. So if you're not sure, uh, grab your instruction book uh, from your camera and uh, find out what uh, these settings, where they are and how to change them. Uh, another mode that I use uh, is always uh, continuous shooting. Uh, subjects could be moving and maybe they're doing some type of action. And just like sports, you want to capture that movement or that motion in peak action. Um, this particular case, I'm walking around Chicago and uh, I see them, uh, you know, my subjects here lining up or sitting up to do something. I'm not sure what, but I have my camera set to continuous focus, autofocus, continuous shooting. I had a Nikon D750. That camera is capable of doing six frames per second. So as they prepared, I, you know, as they started moving, I pressed the button, fired off a few frames, and in my opinion, opinion, uh, number three or the one closest to the right uh, would be peak action for this particular uh, subject or, you know, or uh, <clears throat> this particular situation. Now, some entry level cameras are capable of doing anywhere from two to three frames per second. Uh, the uh, little more intermediate cameras can do anywhere from six to eight frames per second. And now your semi-pro or your pro bodies can do from 10 all the way to 20 frames per second. So as you can imagine, uh, the, more, the faster your, your camera shoots, the more choices you're going to have or chances you're going to have to capture your subject in peak action. Uh, for, but for most, most uh, street photography, all you really need is about three frames per second uh, um, and you know that that seems to work pretty well for me and another setting that you want to be very aware of is the white balance now uh, like I said I have been doing photography for quite some time and um, when I was at Nikon uh, as you know uh, Kodak was the father of uh, digital photography so Nike we at Nikon had a very good rapport with the folks at Eastman Kodak and they actually would bring us their prototypes uh, when they were working on digital cameras. So the very first camera that I actually, very first, excuse me, digital camera that I actually uh, worked with or played with uh, was based off of a film camera. They had actually taken the guts or the, the internals out of the film camera and they put a, electronics in it. It had an umbilical cord coming out of the camera uh, to an external hard, hard drive. And that hard drive was the size of a VCR. So it was quite large. Uh, the capabilities of that camera uh, way back then uh, were one picture per minute. Now, 
the reason I'm mentioning that is because that camera did have auto white balance, uh, but it wasn't really that good. Uh, it did have the AWB setting, which, you know, is an acronym for auto white balance, but we changed that, uh, you know, very quickly to uh, always wrong balance uh, because it, it didn't get it right. Uh, I've got to tell you, though, uh, lately, the cameras that have come out in the past, as five or six years, uh, they do a very good job. They actually work quite well in auto white balance, but uh, there are situations where they can be fooled, uh, such as this one. I was out uh, taking pictures, and as you can see, there is a lot of yellow in that image uh, to the left. That was auto white balance. So it did get fooled. However, I do shoot all, uh, most of the time, or primarily I shoot in RAW. So I'm always able to change my white balance after the fact. Now, I don't like to spend a lot of time behind the computer, uh, like many of us. And uh, so I try to get it as close as possible uh, in the camera. And, you know, that way I have to do the, you know, very least amount of work post. Uh, in this particular case, I was shooting auto white balance. That's what it gave me. But uh, in Photoshop or in Lightroom, you just simply take the slider and move it over to either the right or the left. In this case, it was moved over to the left. Uh, the camera added way too much yellow. So I had to go to the left to take out that yellow and add a little bit of blue. That's what it did. If you are in situations where the lighting is pretty constant and pretty uh, controlled, auto white balance will do a pretty good job. But if it doesn't, uh, then that is the time to go ahead and change the white balance. You can either change it to the Kelvin setting and you personally select what Kelvin uh, temperature that is, or you can do a custom white balance setting. Now, your camera's uh, instruction book will have uh, you know, information on how to go ahead and do that. Now, if you are like a lot of people and you shoot in JPEG, you do know and realize that the JPEG file is a file that's already processed. Uh, so sometimes to change the white balance after the fact becomes a little more difficult. Well, if you do get an image that that's happened to and you can't correct the white balance, uh, fear not because all you need to do is desaturate your image and voila, there you go. Uh, you've now created an awesome black and white, right? So uh, just remember auto white balance, uh, you know, check it, see if it's doing a good job. If not, go ahead and set it, set it manually. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, auto ISO. Okay, so auto ISO is one of those settings that uh, is a little misunderstood in my opinion. Um, I use it uh, sparingly in some situations and usually when my subject is moving very rapidly from a bright scene to a dark scene or back and forth or from a, a very bright or dark background uh, to a you know dark or lighter background or vice versa. When a subject is moving very quickly in those situations, uh, it is very difficult to do to get your exposures right, especially if you want to control uh, something very specific. Let's say, for example, you're shooting a moving subject and you need a fast shutter speed. Uh, in this case, uh, you would go from maybe, let's say, a 500th, if that's what you were shooting, all the way to a 2,000th uh, to, you know, freeze the motion uh, that your subject, uh, you know, uh, is creating. So, in this case, you've changed your shutter speed to stops. Well, if at 500 in shutter priority, your camera had already given you the uh, widest aperture on your lens. So let's say, for example, you had a uh, f4 maximum aperture lens on your camera, and at 500 of a shutter speed, you are already at f4. What happens? Well, the shutter speed, uh, of, excuse me, the aperture uh, symbol inside the viewfinder starts blinking. The camera is telling you that it's gone beyond the parameters. In other words, I can't open up the lens anymore. So you will get a uh, dark picture, an underexposed image because you've chosen a faster shutter speed. Well, that's where auto ISO comes in. Now, auto ISO, uh, the camera is now, uh, now has the opportunity to also change the ISO, which again is one of the three factors for exposure. 
However, uh, what I do is I set the parameters so that the camera doesn't go from, let's say, the native ISO, which in most cameras is 100. That's the lowest ISO. It's designed to be best at 100. And then, it, you know, in auto ISO, it could go up to the highest level, uh, which in my D750 is 12,800 ISO. Well, I've gone out and I've done ISO tests on my camera, and I know uh, that with this particular camera body, I do not like the way images look. They just get too noisy beyond 3200. So what I do is I top it off uh, or I set the parameters. In auto ISO, you can tell the camera never go above this ISO and you can also tell it never drop below this shutter speed. So in street photography, sports photography or that type of uh, photography, uh, it is pretty powerful. Uh, so if I'm out uh, doing street photography and uh, it's pretty bright out but I may go to a faster shutter speed for whatever reason in auto ISO I may go in there and set my parameters and top off my ISO to 400 so now if I'm shooting a subject uh, which is you know going from a bright area to a dark area the camera will not go above 400 ISO so once again auto ISO very powerful uh, when used uh, correctly so another camera setting that uh, you should get familiar with is uh, your metering modes. Uh, most cameras have three metering modes. Uh, some Canons have four. One of those is a combination of two. And I believe their newer cameras uh, have reverted back down to three modes. Anyway, what these metering modes are and the way they work is that uh, matrix is uh, an evaluative or an averaging uh, metering mode. In other words, it's going to view and look at the entire scene uh, in your viewfinder and it's going to average out the exposure. However, uh, some cameras are very smart and they know where you focused. So they will bias the exposure a little bit based on where you have focused. Believe it or not, uh, I, I, I would say about 75 to 80% of the time, I'm shooting in matrix mode. I do know, however, how the meter works. So if I'm looking at my subject matter and I know that it can be fooled, I've already tweaked it before I press the button. Uh, there is a button or a dial on your camera that has a plus and a minus. That is exposure compensation and that you can use in a semi-automated mode. So if I see that my subject matter, my background, for example, is way too bright and my subject in the foreground, um, I can see already that it's probably going to be underexposed. So I go ahead and do a uh, plus two thirds or a full stop depending on how bright that subject uh, background is. So anyway, uh, that's the way I use that particular uh, metering mode. Another meter metering mode uh, that uh, your camera has is center weighted. Now center weighted, the way it works is that uh, it is an average but mostly biased in the center. That center circle will take either 65, 70, 75, 80, or 85 percent of the metering and the rest or the other percentage is going to be tapered off to the edges and down to the corners. Well, that does change and vary from one camera model to another and from one manufacturer to another. So once again, very important to take out your instruction book and see what the weighting and what the size of that metering spot is. Some cameras, uh, the more uh, prosumer or higher end cameras, they give you the ability to change the amount of the weighting and to change the, um, the size of that circle. So now it becomes a little more powerful for you to, uh, when you're in situations, to use that center weighted mode. And the other mode or the last mode there is the spot uh, meter. Spot meter is simply that. It is 100% of the metering taking place in one little small spot in your viewfinder. Now with most cameras, uh, that uh, metering spot uh, goes in conjunction or moves in conjunction with your focusing point. And that's the way I shoot. I will take one autofocus point and I will move it around my viewfinder so that that focusing point is very close to the final composition of my image. And uh, if I'm using spot meter, that's where the metering is going to take place as well. So try those 
metering modes in different situations, all three at the same subject matter and get familiar uh, you know from familiarize yourself as to how they work uh, so for example uh, matrix metering this situation well you know uh, everything is pretty evenly lit uh, yes the uh, my subject matter uh, which is the guy down there on the stoop underneath that awning is a little bit in the shade however that's where I'm focused so it, the camera did bias that just a little bit more and uh, my exposure I think in matrix came out okay um, in other situations however uh, where your subject matter is uh, perhaps a little bit different uh, we are in bright sunlight and the background there is a lot of sky there so in this case I knew that matrix metering would be fooled by all of that bright sky so I chose to go to center weighted in this case and since my subject is in the center that's where the metering happened and uh, the uh, meter behaved uh, a little more appropriate in this case and then there are those situations uh, where you may have to use a spot meter. In this particular case, my subject matter was the sun. Uh, I wanted my uh, exposure to be based on that bright sun because I knew that my foreground or my actually my main subject, which were the statues, would become silhouettes. Uh, and at F16, uh, it's very interesting when you put the sun and or a light source and obscure it with another particular subject, in this case, the hands uh, at F16, the light source becomes a starburst or sunburst in this case. So another interesting trick. So let's go ahead and talk about lenses and lens choices. So when you do street photography in my opinion the lens that you select is pretty much going to determine what type of street photography you're gonna uh, be you know uh, doing uh, prime lenses are those lenses that are uh, fixed focal length uh, usually these lenses have a very large aperture so when the sun goes down or the lighting is uh, uh, you know not as bright they are very you know excellent tools because they have a lot of light gathering capability but a prime lens is one of those very personal lenses it is one of those lenses that allows you to get close to the action or to the subject matter so you come a little you become a little more involved with the actual uh, subject that you're photographing uh, other lenses that you uh, can use for this type of uh, situation is a standard zoom lens now standard zoom lenses are zoom lenses that uh, are usually with a very short focal range and somewhere in between the uh, you know uh, 24 to 70 millimeter range or somewhere in that particular situation uh, these lenses are very flexible because they allow you to a uh, you know be part of the scene or they allow you the ability to back up a little bit and get a little more of the subject matter that you're trying to capture uh, so ideal prime lenses, in my opinion, for street photography are going to be, uh, for example, a 35 millimeter, a 45 millimeter or a 50 millimeter. If you view the world, uh, you know, with uh, uh, with one eye, you know, through the viewfinder an 85 millimeter or a 90 millimeter at the very uh top end of that focal range uh, would be good uh, street photography lenses. Now, ideal standard zoom lenses uh, for this type of uh, street photography where you wanna be close to the action or part of the action uh, would be something like a 24 to 70, uh, 28 to 75, uh, 35 to 150. Uh, those are the focal ranges that uh, we, uh, we make and um, these are ideal for that type of photography. So now when you want to uh, get a lot more of the scene, you're out shooting, but uh, there's a little more background involved in the type of photography that you're doing. Uh, in this case, uh, early morning uh, cadets uh, at, the, um, at Millennium Park in Chicago, they're out doing some routines. Uh, a wide angle lens or an ultra wide angle lens allows me uh, to capture a lot more of the background. So now you can see their environment and where they are, uh, you know, physically in relation to, you know, where you're photographing. 
or when you are in a large crowd, you you uh, are maybe not a participant, but you are recording the event, and there's a lot of people. You are in the mix. A wide-angle zoom lens or a wide-angle lens will allow you uh, to capture a lot more of what's going on. Uh, this example, uh, I was using a prime uh, lens. Uh, this is a wide angle prime lens, also ideal for street photography when you want to capture a lot more of your scene. Uh, believe it, uh, let's see, I believe right here I was probably around uh, 15 to 20 feet from my subject, but a 20 millimeter. Uh, lens allows me to get everything in the foreground, uh, excuse me, everything in the background that I want to incorporate into this image. So ideal lenses for street photography when you want to shoot this particular way, when you want a lot more of the background uh, in your shot uh, would be uh, if you're doing a prime lens, uh, 20 millimeter a 24 millimeter, maybe even perhaps a 28 millimeter. Uh, these lenses are pretty uh, awesome when you uh, do this type of photography. Now, if you want a lens that's a little more flexible then a wide angle zoom lens uh, would be probably uh, a better choice. Uh, 15 to 30, uh, 17 to 28, 17 to 35, 24 to 70, 28 to 70, uh, or if you are using a crop sensor camera, there is a 10 to 24 out there. Now, remember, there is a crop factor. When you mount any lens on a crop sensor camera, uh, you have to do multiply by that crop factor. So if it's a Nikon, a Sony, a Fuji, a Pentax, a Leica, those cameras have smaller uh, sensors. They are APS-C size sensor so it's a smaller uh, cropped in section of a full frame and the crop factor is 1.5 so a 10 to 24 is more like a 15 to 36 uh, even though that lens is designed uh, for a crop sensor camera so remember to do the math so if you choose a longer telephoto uh, zoom lens uh, which is usually my choice I like to capture images that are a little more candid uh, from a distance uh, I don't like to be part of the action and I don't want my uh, you know me being around the subject with the camera because let's face it once you pick up a camera and you point it at somebody and they see you their whole body language their demeanor is going to change so I like to be a little more in the background and taking pictures from a distance uh, you know it gives me a more natural more candid shot and that is my choice of lenses uh, what is ideal about those types of lenses also is that they enable you uh, to, uh, you know, have a little more safer uh, distance. Uh, this particular situation, I'm across the street, 70 to 180 at a, a 180 millimeters, allows me to gather, uh, you know, to capture images of what's going on, but still uh, stay at a harm's way. Uh, the other uh, thing that a telephoto zoom lens allows you to do, it allows you to isolate your subject from the background. So as you zoom out into a telephoto setting, and if your lens has a large aperture, like in this particular case, a 70 to 180 at 2.8, I am able to uh, isolate my subject from the background and, you know, usually block out a lot of that distraction. So that is usually my choice uh, for lenses. Now, there are other types of lenses that you can use. And in my opinion, if you're just getting started in photography and you don't know what type of photography you really want to get into, an all-in-one lens is pretty ideal because it takes you from a wide angle all of the way to a telephoto so you can practice all types of uh, or it, you know, all types of street photography or all types of other type of photography, portraits, landscape, uh, nature, uh, you know, whatnot, all in one lens without having to make multiple, uh, you know, purchases until you are ready. Once you decide, you know what, this is the type of photography I want to do, then you can get a lens that is specialized for that type of photography. So here, uh, I am in uh, Savannah, and I've got my uh, 
28 to 300. I'm walking around the, uh, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, walking around the streets there. I'm walking down the street and I see this flag uh, fluttering in the wind. And then I immediately thought, okay, well, I wonder what it looks like from the back. I wonder if the sun is hitting it at the right angle and if this is going to be backlit. So I walked up past it and across the street and yes, it did. So I probably spent about 15 minutes taking pictures of the flag because the wind was, uh, you know, blowing a, a little bit hard and it was flapping. So it gave you, it gave me a, you know, 20, 30 different looks uh, in 15 minutes. I did use a uh, telephoto setting and I used a slow shutter speed because I wanted that movement to be recorded and maybe just have a little portion of that flag in focus. So uh, again, uh, all-in-one zoom lenses, ideal for all sorts of photography. Uh, this particular case, I'm at a skate park and there are a lot of skateboarders there. But I, what I wanted to do is isolate one of them and maybe capture a type of uh, portrait of sorts. Uh, in this case, uh, this guy was skating across uh, one side to the other. So uh, with an 18 to 400, I was able to isolate a very small portion of him and uh, you know, fast shutter speed, I was able to freeze him as he skated across the, uh, the deck of the, you know, the park there. So anyway, um, 18 to 400, somewhere around the 300 millimeter crop sensor camera, crop sensor lens, guess what? Uh, 300 times 1.5 on an icon, uh, what, 550 millimeters. Uh, that gives you an idea of what uh, that was. So uh, all in one lens, uh, I live in Southern California and uh, one of my assignments a couple years back was to go to uh, Minnesota in mid-November to do an event. Well, it happened to be minus 27 degrees. Uh, I've never been in a situation where uh, it was that cold. Uh, so, but you know, being a photographer, you have to take pictures. So I had a crop sensor camera and a 16 to 300 and uh, I positioned myself, uh, yes, in the comfort of my hotel room by the window and waited for somebody to walk down the sidewalk. I didn't know if that, that was going to happen. I mean, it's that cold. Who's going to be venturing out there? But, you know, uh, patient and, you know, patients told me that somebody uh, actually would. So I waited about 35 to 40 minutes and then waited for that person to get right in between those trees, pressed the button, fired off a couple shots, and uh, this is the closest to what I wanted to capture. So there you go. Um, now, street photography doesn't have to be uh, something that you've that you capture uh, that's going on in front of you. It could be a, a shot that you set up. So in other words, you can actually set up a shot and still consider it street photography. This particular case, um, I was in Venice Beach and they were doing some repairs down the beach, uh, you know, and they moved three guard towers together. So I thought that this would make an interesting backdrop to a shot that I wanted to do. I wanted to cap capture an image of a surfer uh, with the sun setting and the surfboard and so on and so forth. So a little bit of setup. Yes, I ran to a... Uh, a surf shop, rented a surfboard and waited for a victim, waited for somebody to walk down the beach and asked if they would participate. So they agreed. Um, they were actually from Minnesota and they agreed to be part of this. Uh, so gave them the surfboard, waited for the sun to get in the right position, fired off a few frames. And then I uh, agreed to send them a frame once they, you know, once I had processed it, and there you go. And there's nothing wrong with set, you know, with setting up a shot as long as you say that you did. Again, coming from a, a photojournalistic background, we always tell the truth. Which brings us back to you know, uh, coming back to uh, how we see the world. Now we have two eyes, and we view the world horizontally. So. 
you know, most of the time, that's the way we're taking pictures. But you have to make it a habit uh, to tell yourself, okay, uh, now I will go and shoot a vertical. So that's what I do. I will shoot three or four horizontal frames and then I'll flip the camera and I'll shoot a vertical just to see how it looks because sometimes uh, it could give you a uh, you know a better image so uh, I don't know you you pick it it's it is it uh, horizontal or vertical I I happen to like the vertical more than the horizontal so there you go uh, but um, you know also uh, remember if you find an interesting subject uh, come back at a different time of day and see what that looks like so you know uh, came by and shot pictures of this, uh, you know, outdoor uh, amphitheater uh, in Chicago, and then came back at night, and I had no idea that they uh, actually lit it. So once again, a happy accident, and uh, all it took for me was to go out and walk around a little bit more right before I went out to dinner. So, how do I approach street photography? Well. Um, what I like to do is I like to find an interesting subject and I like to park myself there. I will wait until something interesting happens uh, in front of that subject and I may park myself there for 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour and just take pictures as uh, the scene unfolds in front of me. Um, you know, but I'm always aware of what's going on, what's happening. And yes, I do uh, go horizontal, I go vertical, because sometimes those vertical shots uh, uh, are a little more interesting. And, you know, in this case, the horizontal shots uh, enabled me to isolate a little more of the foreground element. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, I think these work a little bit better. I don't know. And yes, I do come back at night if I find a subject matter that's pretty interesting, uh, you know, and I, you know, wonder what it's going to look like at night. This particular case uh, came back and I exposed for the background. I wanted the, uh, you know, the fountains that were uh, backlit with an image uh, to be properly exposed. And yes, I knew that uh, my subjects that would come or walk or stand in front of it uh, would become silhouettes. And that's basically what I was, uh, what I was looking for. So just like any type of photography, we do have to contend with composition. And uh, we've been bombarded with uh, the rule of thirds and uh, a lot of uh, rules in photography when it comes to composition. But, uh, you know, I always follow those as close uh, or as, po as close as possible, you know, when I can. This particular case, rule of thirds, you know, you've got uh, your viewfinder divided into uh, three sections, horizontally and vertically. And what you want to do is you want to put your subject it near, near one of those, uh, you know, uh, cross points. Uh, they are called the power points. Uh, this particular case, I've got my surfer right there down at the bottom, and you've got the whole vast of the scenery uh, in front of him. And, uh, you know, I think this makes, uh, in this particular shot, that's, that was the composition that, uh, that I was looking for. I also look for leading lines. Uh, leading lines are great uh, for leading your subject's eye or vision to your subject. In this particular case, you've got the corner of the fountain. That is nice and sharp. That is a leading line. And you also have the splashing of the water. Uh, with a slow shutter speed, I was able to record a lot more of that splashing, of that white water splashing. Now, I'm using both of those uh, intersects, intersecting down to that corner of that fountain as a lead line to lead your eye right to my subject. Uh, one thing to remember is that uh, anytime you're photographing a subject that is moving, uh, whether it be a human, an animal, or whatever, you want to give it a little bit of breathing room. You want to go ahead and uh, give it a little more space in the direction that they're either looking or moving towards. This particular case, I'm out shooting. I have already selected a focusing point that is closer to the right of the frame. This forces the composition to allow a little more room in front of the subject. And this particular case, continuous autofocus, yes, continuous shooting, and just simply a, a slow shutter speed to give some of that uh, uh, image blur, and there you go. Um, 
that uh, simply works for me. Now, when I'm out photographing, I try to fill my frame as much as possible. I don't really like to crop a lot um, because, you know, when you crop, you actually are throwing away data. Uh, this particular case, I was shooting the cyclist on the path and something caught my eye. I was using a 70 to 180 and I was already at 180 millimeters. When I photograph moving subjects, I usually shoot with both eyes open. Um, my, I am left eye dominant and I am looking through the viewfinder. So my right eye is open and it's looking at the subjects coming into the frame and I see what's going on. So I saw this guy approaching. I quickly lifted my camera, pointed it at the subject, fired off one frame. That's all the opportunity I had. I just had uh, enough time to shoot one frame because then everything else moved in in front of my subject and uh, uh, composition was uh, really, uh, there was no chance to really do any composition. Uh, so what I did is I cropped it after the fact. And this is uh, what I consider uh, you know, to be my, uh, you know, the, my best crop uh, for this particular situation. And as you can see, uh, this is about 50% of the original image. So I've thrown away 50% of my data. I started with 24 megapixels. I am now down to 12. Is that a bad thing? Well, it really depends on what you're going to do with your image. The problem here is I may not know what I'm going to do with this image if I do anything a year down the road. So that is where the problems may occur. If all I'm going to do is presentations uh, on a high def uh, screen here, this is a uh, 1920 by 1080. So 1920 pixels this way and 1080 pixels going this way. Multiply those two numbers, you get 2.2 million and, and change. Uh, so all I need is about 2 million pixels to uh, show an image on this type of screen. Okay, well, technology gets better, or maybe you want to make a larger print. So uh, there are now uh, 4K TVs. They were introduced about five years ago, I believe, four or five years ago. And 4K TVs uh, needs four times the resolution. So you go from 2 million pixels all the way up to 8 million pixels. As you can begin to see, that is where issues might uh, come, but I've got 12, so no worries there. However, uh, new technology. Last year, they introduced 8K TVs. Now you need four times the resolution of 4K. So guess what? In order to show an image on that screen at its full resolution, now I need 32 million pixels. That's where the problems lie. So anyway, uh, like I said, I like to crop in camera as much as possible and get my image as close as possible to the final uh, so that I, A, spend less time behind the computer and I'm not, uh, you know, um, I don't prevent myself from future proofing my image. Uh, and there you go. So. Another thing I like to do when I'm doing street photography is I like to look for shades of gray and uh, the perfect time to uh, shoot uh, black and white images, believe it or not, is when it's overcast because uh, the lighting is very muted, but in black and white, it makes for a very, uh, you know, good up opportunity. This case, I'm walking around. I see the, all these shades of gray. Yes, there is a human element there, as you can see the stroller, and is composed uh, down at the bottom, one of the PowerPoints there. Uh, this image has almost no cropping. I mean, there is a smidge of cropping to this, but almost nothing. But uh, I see all these shades of gray, and I'm already thinking of black and white. So I always shoot in color and what I do is I desaturate my image after the fact because if you set your camera to black and white uh, and you're shooting a JPEG, you've simply just converted that image to a black and white. And if somebody uh, asks you, can you give me a color uh, print of this particular shot, guess what? Impossible. Uh, so shoot it in color and convert it to black and white. So I basically, uh, what I will say is find yourself a uh, interesting subject or something that you uh, consider interesting. 
and just simply wait until the human element comes your way. Uh, this particular case, I'm shooting a billboard there. Uh, I'm on the sidewalk right on the edge and I'm waiting for somebody to walk by. Uh, people see me with the camera and they think that they're uh, in my way so they stop right at the edge of the frame. But what I do is I simply wave them through. No, 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 you're fine. Come on, just go, just go ahead. And, uh, you know, I do this constantly until I get something that I think might be interesting. And there you go. Um, I also like to work the scene. In other case, I will find an interesting subject and I walk around and I see how can I make this better. In this particular case, I find a subject and say, okay, well, let me work on this and let me get a little bit closer and let me see how that looks. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, my subject here is these two uh, cups of uh, you know, coffee that were left right there in the middle of the pathway. Uh, so work on my image a little bit more, change my composition, get a little bit closer, and hopefully come out with a better image. And this is what I came up with, uh, in my opinion, one of the better shots in this particular uh, case, in, you know, in the, for this particular uh, scene or environment. Just waited for them to do something. They were just sitting there talking, and then finally, they uh, he takes the cell phone out, and they're doing a selfie. So I found that to be a little more interesting and there you go so what do I pack in my camera bag well I'll be honest with you that really depends on where I'm going and what I'm going to be photographing uh, but usually I will pack a backpack and I'll take it to that particular location uh, that backpack uh, usually contains two two or three camera bodies, a full frame DSLR, a crop sensor DSLR, and yes, a mirrorless camera, a mirrorless full frame camera. I will usually pack uh, four to five lenses as well, spare batteries uh, for each one of the cameras. Luckily, two of the cameras use the same battery, so that makes things a little bit easier. And I will, uh, pack camera straps, believe it or not, different camera straps. Um, when I'm walking around a, uh, you know, a, a scene or a subject, I will usually go with a hand strap, you know, wrap the camera around my hand and walk around and take pictures that way. But if I'm going to be walking uh, around downtown or some uh, in a situation like that, I will take a, a strap that goes around my shoulder and carries my camera uh, more like a messenger style. I can pick it up quickly, put it up to my face, take the picture and then dr drop it back down and let it hang and proceed walking. Uh, these, this particular strap system, uh, very flexible because all I have to do is unclip uh, one and then clip the other one. So it makes things very easy. I will also carry an, a spare bag inside uh, my bag a smaller bag that will allow me to carry one camera body and maybe one or two lenses. Uh, the reason is I don't want to carry this 35 to 45 pound camera bag, uh, you know, around the city. I don't want to be a target um, and it's not comfortable. So I try to minimize what I carry and what I, you know, shoot with usually one camera, one lens uh, for that particular outing. Uh, because you just simply may never know what's going to happen. Uh, so three weeks ago, I'm out, uh, three, three weeks, four weeks, something like that. I'm out riding. Uh, I was tired of being quarantined. So I got my bike. I inflated the tires, uh, got a camera, uh, backpack, and I took uh, one camera, and I believe I had two lenses with me. And uh, I was riding up to Santa Monica, and I rode into a uh, peaceful protest. So, you know, I figure, okay, so I've got my cycling attire on, I've got my cycling shoes, so I'm, you know, walking like a duck with these shoes with a metal platform on the bottom, and I've got the bike in one hand, the backpack on my back, and then the camera in the other hand, and just walking around taking pictures. Uh, so, you know, I decided, okay, well, let me make a story out of this. Uh, so I said, okay, um, let's start with that. And okay, let's capture a little bit of what's going on. There we go. Uh, again, uh, ultra 
uh, wide angle lens allows me to get very close to the subject uh, and capture a lot more of the scene. Um, and okay, so now we've got, uh, you know, the police in their riot gear. We've got the protesters there peacefully sitting down, not wanting to move. Well, that's not what they were ordered, so there you go. And um, now I switch lenses. I've got a 70 to 180. I'm a little bit further back, taking pictures from a more safe, uh, you know, distance. And then I come back the following day, uh, you know, the, and see what's going on. So they had totally uh, locked down uh, downtown uh, National Guard, can't get there, can't move anywhere. Uh, businesses begin to, uh, you know, board up uh, so that uh, they don't get uh, looted. And, um, you know, but people are still walking around. And, uh, you know, a couple of days later, um, you know, everything is sort of back to normal-ish. And there you go. So, uh, I will suggest that uh, if you want to try street photography, uh, give yourself some assignments. Uh, okay, today I'm going to walk out with one camera and one lens and see what I get. Or today I'm going to walk out and go to this particular part of town and capture an image from this particular vantage point. Something that will force you to uh, work the subject, work the image, and uh, capture images that you've, you know, but never really uh, had before. Uh, most of these images that you saw in this presentation was from an assignment that I gave myself. Uh, I was out in Chicago doing an event, uh, but I had an uh, early afternoon flight and uh, with a two hour deficit and then gaining two hours, I figured, okay, I'm going to photograph two cities with one camera and one lens. So I took one camera and the 45 millimeter and I was able to shoot, uh, you know, uh, Chicago and Los Angeles, Venice Beach, uh, you know, all in one day. So that was an assignment that I gave myself. But uh, I will always uh, recommend that when you're out shooting, uh, you know, uh, have fun. Uh, and don't forget to take a selfie. Uh, so you can follow me on social media. Um, I am on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Do we have any questions? We do have some questions. Um, before we jump into the questions, just want to uh, uh, make a quick announcement. Uh, I, some of you uh, may have seen in the chat section, but uh, for anybody who might have joined, uh, joined late or wants to see this information again, um, uh, uh, Looking Glass will be following up uh, everybody with uh, with a, a recording of this uh, presentation. So um, that being said, a uh, couple of the questions. Let me go to where I had them. So it was funny because I actually I was thinking this exact same question, and then we had uh, somebody ask it in the uh, in the the chat room. Um, you had quite a few photos in there of other people. Uh, and particularly uh, of children and the, the kids, you know, playing in the water in the park and whatnot. Um, have you ever had any uh, interactions? I mean, I think we all kind of know the, the chances of if you're going to be out walking around with the camera and taking pictures of people, um, the chances of them being, uh, you know, a little sensitive to that uh, are, are really good. Um, so have you ever had uh, any kind of interactions? How did you handle it? Um, and, uh, and just sort of how do you handle photographing people um, when and if uh, they do see you taking their picture? Like you'd said earlier that, that a lot of folks, uh, I mean, when you're doing your street photography, you're, you're kind of, you're trying to, you know, be a, a ninja, essentially. You're sort of, you're trying to blend in, uh, not be noticed, but it's, uh, that's not always, you know, not always uh, the case, so. Yeah. Well, w one of the ways that I try to approach it is, you know, uh, have a camera and a lens that's very, that's, in just, you know, that's not in your face. I'm, I'm not going to take a big giant DSLR with a 70 to 200 uh, because, you know, yes, that will tell people, yes, he is a professional photographer and he's out taking pictures. You know, I will uh, lean more towards a smaller, more compact camera body that doesn't look professional. So I don't look the part. Uh, that's one way I approach it. Um, if I'm photographing people, I will usually try to take pictures of them, of them when they're not looking 
at me or in my direction. Uh, that uh, helps a little bit with those confrontations, if you will. Uh, it's a matter of fact, two weeks ago, uh, I was out writing and I did have the new 28 to 200 uh, with the Sony uh, mirrorless camera. And I was out taking pictures, just playing with the lens. And this one guy approached me, he goes, you have any pictures of me? And I go, uh, no, I don't believe so. Uh, I said, he, you know, I said, I'm taking pictures over there in that direction. Were you over there? And he goes, well, I might have been. I said, were you doing this, this, and that? And he goes, well, no. I said, then I don't have any pictures of you. And, and, and that was pretty much it. I said, I'm concentrating on taking pictures of these guys doing this on that sand dune. He goes, oh, okay. Well, is that legal, he says. And I go, well, yes, it is legal. I said, in the United States, if a person is in a public place, you can take pictures of that person and you don't have to have their permission or their consent. And that is the law, by law. However, if you are taking pictures of someone and you want to monetize it, if you're going to turn this into an advertisement or an editorial of some kind, then you do have to get their permission. You have to get a model release. This particular case, I'm just showing pictures and doing a presentation, uh, not necessary to do that. Uh, so if you are planning on maybe perhaps selling your images, uh, it's best that you walk around with your camera bag uh, full of uh, model releases. And you then you have to approach the person and say, you know what, I might have caught you uh, here and taking a picture of you, uh, show them the picture. Uh, if they like it, they might say, hey, you wanna, that's great. I like it. Can you send me one? Uh, and then they won't mind signing that model release in case you do decide to monetize it. Uh, when it comes to photographing uh, children, that gets a little tricky. Uh, what I usually do is I see the parent uh, you know, interacting with their child or just simply watching their child, I'll get close to them to see if the question is going to arise as to why are you taking pictures here? I'll have a small conversation if it comes to that. And if they see me taking a picture of their child, they'll either say, you know what, I'd rather you not. And then I'll delete it. Uh, or usually, and I would say 90% of the time, they don't mind. They see you uh, just there taking pictures and, you know, whatnot. Okay, cool. Yeah, that helps. I think the, um, you know, the, the carrying around model releases for, uh, um, you know, even if it's just to, and, and probably your business card would, would help sort of, uh, uh, you know, buffer some of the situations showing your, your kind of professional uh, uh, standings and, uh, and probably help the situation. So, um, Good. Uh, someone else here had a question uh, a little bit about your post-processing, um, what you use to edit uh, Lightroom or Photoshop or a different um, app. Um, and if you have any post-processing settings um, that achieve a certain look. Okay. Um, I will use both Lightroom and Photoshop. Usually the way I shoot is I will go out on a day and I, if I capture two, 300 images, I will do a very rough edit in camera. Uh, I will look at the back of the screen and just kind of look at the images and go, oh, I think I like this one and I think I like that one and so on and so forth. If I'm in a hurry and if I need to get something done for a presentation or whatever the case is, I will then take those images that I did rough edits on and I will go straight into Photoshop and tweak it. Uh, if I'm not sure what I'm going to work on or process, then I take the whole batch into Lightroom. I'll look at everything, I'll tag it, and I say, okay, I think I'm going to like these, and then I will take that batch into Lightroom and do my uh, tweaks. And the way I, I approach my, uh, my adjusting, it's usually I work on the highlights a little bit. Uh, I work on the shadows and the whites and the blacks first, and then I will move down to the... Um, you know, the other settings, and I will adjust those accordingly. So I'm talking about the saturation, the vibrance, and, uh, uh, you know, the clarity, and so on and so forth. Then 
I move up to back again to the contrast and the exposure. Uh, because when you add uh, saturation and, uh, uh, you know, dehaze and all that stuff, it usually adds a lot of contrast to your image. So then I have to go back and do the contrast last. And then if I need to, then I, I will slide my exposure, uh, you know, as a final thing. Um, then what I'll do is after I, after I'm done that, I've done that, I will go then and if I need to crop or if I need to sharpen, then I'll do that last. Okay. Uh, we got a, a question. If you could flip back to your um, screen showing your contact information. There you go. Um, and then uh, one of the last questions we had here, um, uh, as far as uh, settings, when, what, what kind of settings or how would you set your camera to uh, when you're doing photographing like through windows, uh, through glass and anything where you've got reflective you know, surface. Okay, yes, yeah. so uh, if I'm going to be photographing through a reflective surface, I will approach it one of two ways. I will either get as close as possible to that actual window um, using my lens hood and actually butting it up right up to the glass. Uh, and usually at a 45 degree angle to get rid of some of that glare. That usually helps and that usually works. Um, if that doesn't, then you do have to put on a filter. Uh, you have to put on a polarizing filter on your uh, lens to, uh, you know, to do away with uh, glare from non-metallic surfaces. Mm -hmm. That is the job of a polarizing filter. Just know that that's going to cut the amount of light by either a stop and a half to two stops, depending on the filter that you use. Cool. Okay. Um, I think that's all I saw for uh, questions. Um, uh, anybody with any last minute questions, pop them up there. Uh, and a quick plug again for uh, Looking Glass, uh, our partner in this today, um, you know, for uh, polarizing filters or, uh, you know, Armando had talked earlier about uh, you know, some of the, the camera bags that he uses carrying around his, his uh, lenses while he's doing his street photography. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff is, uh, you know, Looking Glass is a, a great resource for those things. They can, you know, by calling them, stomping in there, they are open and then allowing people in. Um, they, can, uh, they can help you find those things and, and kind of give you some guidance on, you know, which would be the best for you. So, um, quick, people can't um, come in. <laughs> but they can oh, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought we, were, uh, we were able to let them in now. Uh, we are making our own safety decisions. So as we open up one part, we're waiting to see what the impact of each of those parts is. Um, so I just, I want to be really clear. Like we are definitely open. We've got staff in the store. We're doing everything we can to help you, but we are not currently letting customers in except um, very specifically by appointment. We have set aside one piece of the store that is completely sanitized and uh, and you can set an appointment if you need to get, um, we call it for more explanation and exploration than we can do via Zoom or um, the phone, so. Gotcha, okay. Glad we clarified that. Yeah. So call first, <laughs> um, but watch for, uh, definitely watch for Looking Glass to follow up with, uh, with everybody with a follow-up email, kind of going over uh, available rebates and things like that. Um, uh, just wanna make sure we're not missing any uh, more questions over here. Mostly it's just a lot of people telling you that you did a really great job, Armando. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> there you go. Um, great. I think if that's, uh, oh, nope. Uh, here's one. Uh, do you carry business cards and or wear your Tamron hat or shirt when you are out taking these photos? If I'm out taking pictures, I usually don't have the Tamron garb or attire. Um, if I get in trouble, I don't want to have Tamron involved uh, in that <laughs> particular situation. Um, if somebody uh, starts a conversation or I start a conversation with someone and then it comes up that they may like an image or something like that, then I will uh, break out the business cards and hand them one. Uh, so I try to do it ninja style and just uh, below the radar type of thing. That's just, that's just my personality. Okay. 
Well, that was that, uh, the last of the questions. So um, big thanks to Armando for you know, coming in here and imparting his knowledge uh, on us, hopefully inspiring everyone. Uh, and big thanks to Looking Glass for uh, working with us on this one. And uh, like I said, stay tuned to uh, the Looking Glass follow-up via email, uh, and they will have information on more. Uh, we've got one more webinar in June still. That's happening next week on Tuesday, so uh, look out for that. And then we have more uh, upcoming webinars. Um, actually, I'm sorry, there's, there's still uh, one this Thursday. Uh, for any Sony shooters, we're going to be uh, covering with Armando um, the, uh, all of the uh, camera Sony mirrorless lens line, which is uh, definitely a very exciting conversation um, for us and for those Sony shooters. So, uh, And then uh, more upcoming webinars uh, for July. So um, thanks you, uh, thank you guys again for... Uh, for joining us here today and we'll we'll see you again soon. Thanks everybody. Thank Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye guys.